Hi, everybody. Rebecca Walser, your host of Crashes and Taxes, Challenging the Status Quo of Crashes, Taxes, and Politicians. Today, I am super excited because we are going to be discussing America's primary source of retirement funds for uh, since really the 80s and why this vehicle is just such a disastrous failure for America. And so this is a podcast unto itself, and there's a lot of information to digest here as always. And so we're gonna do our best to get all of these snippets into and for you. Um, So clearly, our main retirement vehicle since the 80s has been the 401k, what you're offered at your employer. And so for those of you that are millennials or for those of you even Gen Xers um, that don't know this, uh, before the um, 401k came into being in the 80s, we had what we called defined um defined benefit plans. In other words, you would go to your employer, you would work for 30 years, and when you retired, they would pay you a pension for the rest of your life. They might give you a gold watch, and then they'd say, thank you for three decades of service. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice. Three decades of service. We're going to give you, uh, pay you a pension now for your remainder of your life until you die. It was a lifetime payment guaranteed by the corporation, and maybe they gave you a gold watch on the way out the door. Well, you combine your pension with social security and you maintain a pretty substantial percentage of your pre-retirement income. So probably close to maybe 80 to even 80, over 80% of your income was maintained between your pension and your social security. So social security is a a topic onto itself. We've got to do a specific podcast just about what is going on in this decade with social security. This is the decade, my friends, where everything is changing. This is it. We are here between 2020 and 2030. I promise you everything will look unrecognizable by the end of this decade. But moving on from there, we we have to do another topic separately on that. Let's just go back to the 401k. So back when we had defined benefit plans, um, you know, the company was completely responsible for the success, the guaranteeing the success of the ability to pay that pension to you for the rest of your life. And that was very expensive for companies. A lot of companies had a lot of trouble with uh, doing that and and weren't really necessarily funding it correctly. They were underfunding it. And so some legislation started to come out um, in the 80s that really made uh, companies have to reserve more to be able to fund their pension. So that was starting to be a problem. But what you had happened in 1979, the Revenue Act of 1979, Uh, 78 rather, my my brain today, Revenue Act of 78 rather, um, had a little provision, a really obscure provision in it that was really set up by uh, highly compensated executives by corporate America. So really it was an executive tax dodge. Um, Basically corporations were trying to uh, attract better talent and they said, look, we already offer them a pension. They already have golden handcuffs if they leave. We already, you know, we can't, we need to give give them something else on top of all of what we already do to get more talent. And so they decided, let's give them a kind of a vested bonus schedule. If they stay with us and they, you know, remain with us, then when they retire, we'll give them even more money on top of their pension. And yet, you know, this will be money that can be invested in the market, but, you know, we won't give it to them until they retire it'll be held until they retire and they um they you know that that's what we're going to do and so they went to the irs and they said or the treasury department rather and they said look we want to give this extra bonus to highly compensated executives but we know that if we you know give it if we put this money into an account with their name on it um basically it's there's something in the tax law that we call it's basically you know a constructive receipt and we don't want them to have to pay taxes on this money through constructive receipt tax law because basically they're not going to have access to it. They're not going to be vested. They're not going to get it until the after they separate from service. And so the IRS or the Treasury Department said, okay, uh, we will do this new provision through Congress, the Revenue Act of 78, and it's called the 401k. And the 401k basically will say that you contribute, you employer can contribute, the employee can also contribute, um, but it will not be accessible to them until they separate from service or to a certain age. And um, otherwise, that's when they'll pay the tax on it. So we got con- contributory 
self-contributory and company contributory market-based accounts that had tax deferred for the first time. Because remember, the pension is fully in the purview of the company. They're investing dollars, they're, they're building up those reserves, they are responsible for those payments, and the employee has no ability to touch those funds or invest them, do anything with them. So this was the first time we had a contributory uh, tax deferred vehicle for which markets uh, could be used and leveraged to invest in. And so when you look at it from that perspective, what it did is it did pave the way for Wall Street to get a lot more dollars invested directly in the markets because pension funds are a lot more conservatively invested usually in institutional bonds. So the 401k was born and it really went nowhere. Like nobody used it at all until 1981. In 1981, there was a benefits consultant for a company called Johnson Company, not to be confused with Johnson Johnson, that was reviewing the code, the tax law code, for some bizarre reason I don't know because he's not even a CPA, but he was reviewing the code and he found this obscure provision and he had a bank client, it was as a consulting firm, he had a, a bank client that wanted to uh, figure out a way to give cash bonuses in, in lieu of uh, you know something else, like a savings plan. And so he said, oh my gosh, this is actually great. We can use this 401k provision. It's supposed to apply to highly compensated executives. There's a lot of tax code that applies only to highly compensated people. But they basically said, I think we can use this, this uh, 401k here and set up this new plan. And um, so he, he used the 401k. They presented it. It was accepted by the IRS to be expanded beyond uh, highly compensated executives. The bank didn't end up using it. So the bank said, no, thank you. Um, they turned the proposal down. But Johnson um, Company itself actually used the plan and implemented the first 401k plan for employees. And once the plan in 1981 started to be leveraged by a company in this way, this caught on like wildfire. It spread so fast, so quickly as the primary vehicle of our retirement system. And if you think about why, it's just so clear on its face. Why? First, the company transfers all the risk from them to guarantee a pension that's getting an investment return that will guarantee all these payments out when these people retire based on mortality, actuarial science, all of these things. It shifts the risk completely away from the employer to have to guarantee returns, set aside reserves, all these things are done. Second, it gives the employer a current tax deduction for what they're contributing, right? So you get a current write-off even though these people can't get this money and the money stays on your platform in your, in your employer plan. And third, basically it reduced their funding by a, a massive amount. I mean, think about it. The employer basically was saying, oh, before we were guaranteeing you about 70%, 60 or 75% of your pre-retirement um, earnings every year until your death. Every year until your death. But now, all we're going to give you is some crazy formula of we're going to match uh, 100% of the first 3% of your salary, and then we'll match you 50% of the next uh, 3% of your salary. So basically, if you're lucky, you might get a 100% match on 6% of your salary. Or, you know, it's just the formula that they came up with with what they were going to actually contribute to you was nowhere near what they were paying for a pension, a defined benefit versus what we now call a defined contribution. So companies went to this in droves and you clearly saw a, a, a pivotal point in American history where we shifted from pensions to 401k. Uh, employees loved it because in 1981, just to bring a little bit of tax in here now, in 1981, our top tax rate for active earnings was 50%. Our top tax rate for passive earnings, so if you're a real estate investor earning passive earnings, 70%. So our top tax rates were 50 and 70%. And people were, were starving for a way that they could defer paying those awful tax rates on their earnings. So if they're in their highest earning years, the conventional wisdom was born of don't pay tax now in your highest earning years. No, 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 taxes are way too high. Defer, build up all this wealth pre-tax because when you retire, you'll be in such a little tax bracket with just your little social security that you'll be getting that you will take a distribution of this Combine that with your social security and your tax will be much lower because you'll be in a lower bracket. So that was the conventional wisdom and it got Americans addicted, literally in the early 80s, addicted to the fact 
that we did not have to pay those high taxes. And then you had a lot of savvy marketing coming out from Wall Street that saw this huge opportunity. In fact, it was a huge opportunity for Wall Street and markets really grew and access to markets really grew to everyday people that wasn't previously there. So you saw, you know, obviously a market boom with a lot more capital being available to be invested in the average Joe between a mutual fund or buying a stock or buying a bond through their employer plan. So that was a good thing. That was actually a very good thing. But what you saw was people um, having access. And so this conventional wisdom came out that said, um, don't pay the taxes now. Buy in, let this money compound and compound and compound and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow grow for 15, 20, 30 years while you're working. And then when you don't pay the taxes, let all the money compound upon itself. And then when you when you retire, you'll pay little taxes and you'll have had all that compounded growth. Now, I don't have time now to go through the math. I will do a podcast solely where all we do is actually walk through the math of why that is totally not true. All right, we will do a separate podcast of walking through that math. We don't have time today. But what I will tell you is the 401k was born and it spread like wildfire. And so... Now, fast forward, literally almost 40 years, actually really at 40 years, it'll be 40 years next, next, next year, 2021, it'll be 40 years, right? To 81 to 91 to 2001 to 2021, yeah, it's 40 years, four decades later almost. And what are the results of the 401k? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but they're horrible. They're absolutely horrible because there are two things that are a big, huge problem with the 401k's design. So... Uh, the first thing is just the way people use it, okay? People tend to only invest what they're limited to investing. So if you look at the average American, they don't really start investing or even thinking about their retirement until they're usually in their 40s. Unless you've got a diligent person whose parents really train them to be really super financially savvy, most people don't even start thinking about this until their late 30s, 40s, really. So you've got, you've got a 40-year-old who's starting to you know, basically say, oh gosh, I don't think I'm gonna work for 20 more years and uh, or 25 more years, and I've gotta build up the next 30 years of support in the next 25 years. And you know what? Most people don't max out their 401k. So right now the limit is 19,500 if you're under 50, another catch up provision if you're 50 or over. Most people do not max out their 401k. But if they were a diligent saver and if they were gonna do the math to figure out how much they should be setting aside when they start in their 40s to really replace their income, they would have so much they would need to be contributing on an annual basis. It's well beyond the limits that the US government sets. So that's a problem. We start too late. We save too little. And then, of course, we say we're limited. We say, oh, well, gosh, all I can save for my retirement is $19,500. That's not true. Who told you that? That's all you can save in a pre-tax vehicle, okay? That's all you can save in a pre-tax vehicle unless you do a small IRA as outside. That's all you can save in a pre-tax vehicle. That isn't, the government doesn't tie your hands and say that all you can save per year is $20,000. You can do whatever you want. It just doesn't have to be pre-tax. So the first problem is we simply just do not save enough. The second problem is that it's in a a market-based vehicle with no guarantees. All of the risk has been transferred from the employer onto our shoulders. And as individual investors, we are only given so many options inside of our 401k. Maybe they're great, maybe they're horrible. We don't know. And we don't know what we're doing. The 401k was designed to be professionally managed for highly compensated executives. It was not designed for the average Joe who doesn't know what he's doing. And not to say that the average, you know, obviously if you're listening to my podcast, you're a pretty savvy person. You probably do know what you're doing. But there's a lot of people out there. Trust me when I tell you, they don't know what they're doing. They're just picking a fund. They're just, so this sounds good. Check, check. They have no idea if it meets their you know, individual needs, and then they do that. This, the, of course, the other problem that we've talked about at length on this podcast that we'll continue to talk about is the fact that it's in the market, right? And people don't pick you know, long-term bond funds to invest in the 401k. No, they pick the you know, really attractive growth funds that they think, oh, I've got all this time, I'm gonna pick the growth fund. Okay, you're gonna go on the ride of the roller coaster of the 401 of the market, which is fine. The market roller coaster is fine if you have 20 plus years, 30 years, if you have 10 years or less, 15 years left, maybe it's not fine that we lose five years of time just getting back what we already had when we started before the crash. Maybe that's not fine. So you've got market volatility. You've got not knowing exactly what you're doing. You've got no guarantee now from your employer anymore. You've got them contributing such a small amount compared to what they used to contribute. They're basically ripping us off from that perspective. 
And then you've got the fact that it's pre-tax and you've been fed this lie that if you invest pre-tax and you compound all this growth when you retire, you'll have more earnings and you'll pay a lower tax. That's not going to end up happening because everything is changing in this decade from 2020 to 2030. Nobody's talking about it. Everybody still conventionally tells you maximize your pre-tax accounts, but it's a lie. It's a lie that the government themselves have on record for almost uh, let's see, uh, 12 years, almost 15 years now, we have on record a government report that tells us that higher taxes will come and must come. They must come mathematically. So no, a lot of Americans are going to retire and with comparatively Trump's tax plan, they might actually end up paying more taxes in retirement than what they paid if they had paid those taxes all along. So that's another myth. So the 401k fails on a lot of fronts. And this should not shock us because the 401k was never t- designed to be the retirement vehicle for all Americans. It was designed to be a tax dodge for highly compensated executives. And some guy someday randomly said, hey, we can make a plan out of this. It's not his fault, I'm not blaming him. He said, we can make a plan out of this. And that plan was taken and implemented without any white paper analysis, without any back testing or forward testing or um, actuarial science or mathematical, you know, uh, algebra done to figure out, is this make sense? Does it make sense for us to give up our pension way of retiring for every person and go to a defined contribution plan? Um, Does that make sense? That's pre-tax. Does that make sense? And if they had done the math, they would have realized this is going to fail most people. That's the last problem that we emotionally invest and we emotionally invest our 401ks and companies did not emotionally invest their pensions. They, ba- they invested their pensions based on mathematical actuarial science. So those guarantees were there. When people are investing their 401ks, they invest emotionally, especially during times of crashes like we have with the virus. So this is all a true disaster. And this is why the 401k as an experiment has completely failed. If you don't have a plan, if all you have is an investment, if all you have is a 401k, you need to talk to somebody, whether it's my team uh, or national practice, talk to a certified financial professional, talk to somebody who can give you a plan. You need a plan. Till next time, take care everybody.